Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Corpus Cast, the podcast from Aston University about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. I'm your host, Dr. Robbie Love. Today, our topic is corpus assisted discourse studies, known as CADS, uh, an approach to the study of language that combines corpus linguistics and discourse analysis, and quite often specifically crisp, critical discourse analysis. And uh, several previous Corpus Cast guests have uh, drawn on these approaches uh, in contexts such as social justice, discrimination, marginalization, political discourse, and business communication, among others. Now, today, I'm speaking with somebody uh, who you may call a pioneer of this approach, having been publishing research in this area um, as early as 1995 uh, with the paper Only Connect, Critical Discourse Analysis and Corpus Linguistics. My guest is Galinda Mautner, Professor of English Business Communication at Vienna University of Economics and Business. Uh, Galinda pursues research interests located at the interface of language and society, and specifically of language and business. Uh, her work also focuses, and this is what we'll be discussing today, on methodological questions revolving around mixed methods research and exploring the opportunities and challenges of interdisciplinary cooperation. Her most recent book, Corpus Assisted Discourse Studies, co-authored with Matthew Gillings and previous Corpus Cast guest, in fact, our first ever guest, Paul Baker, was published in 2023. So today we'll be discussing the synergy between corpus linguistics and discourse analysis. analysis and uh, I'm very excited to have as our guest on today's episode of Corpus Cast, Professor Galinda Mountner. Galinda, welcome to Corpus Cast. It's great to see you. Hi, Robbie. Good to see you. Great to be Thank here. Thank you so much for uh, for coming on. Um, and uh, we have an awful lot to chat about, so uh, I won't waste any time. Um, and I'm going to start with the question that I uh, almost always begin with uh, for, for our guests on Corpus Cast. Uh, uh, quite a big question, I suppose. Uh, what does corpus linguistics mean to you? Well, it it means being able to um, analyse, grapple with, stroke survive, working with large amounts of data uh, and yet use those data to say something useful and interesting and exciting about the connection between the language and society. For me personally, it's a... I'm not sure that's a contradiction term. It's a good go-to method, but it's not necessarily and not always the go-to method. But I think we'll come to that, won't we? Indeed. And and I think it, it, it brings up the, uh, I suppose, often discussed question about whether we consider corpus linguistics a, a, a theory uh, and or a, a method. Um, and yes, we will we will discuss uh, among many of the things um, the the uh, I suppose identity uh, that that we may take on as as a researcher um, in uh, being somebody who applies corpus methods because that's what you do, or rather select corpus methods if and only when or if they're appropriate. Um, Yes, lots of lots of big things to discuss today. Very excited uh, to, to to have you here. Um, I, let's go back a little bit, sort of, uh, in your your career and and think not necessarily specifically about corpus linguistics, but language and linguistics more broadly. Um, when when was it that you sort of first became interested in the study of language and and kind of came to the realization that this is what you wanted to 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 do uh, in your career? Um, that is so um, gosh, that's going down in personal history. Um, and actually, I I think I, I I know I know exactly. Well, not the moment or the day, but certainly the the, the year when it when it all happened. Um, when I was fourteen, um, we had um, um, you know we got a new English teacher who uh, was then to remain my English teacher for you know, the remaining four years of grammar school and also became a, was one of my lecturers at uni. And he had, still has this absolute fascination with language and he, you know, passed that on to his students or to, to, to me at least. Um, and um, that's how it all started. And he was also 
Um, you said, you know, what made you want to go into linguistics or study linguistics? Um, he was also uh, the person who said, rather categorically, actually, thinking back, but when I was like 17 or something, uh, approaching A-levels, and uh, he said very categorically, you know, you really do need to study English. And I did, you know, <laughs> taking his advice, being a good girl. Uh, and discounting all our options, uh, and uh, that's how it, it all took off. Um, and there was a second really decisive moment, and again, you know, down to to him, this particular English teacher. Um, he was, as I mentioned, one of my lectures at uni. And um, when I was in my third semester, I think he um, in he organised a um, teaching a teacher training seminar. At, at the University of Vienna, okay. and he got um, John Sinclair. He invited John Sinclair to to speak. In fact, John kind of ran the seminar, you know, uh, guided by um, you know we did the or my, my teacher did the admin and and, um, and and also contributed substantively, of course. But you know, John was the star guest, and I was the student helper. I was drafted in as a student helper, you know, carting photocopies around and things, and and also listening. And I think that's when it clicked. Uh, John Sinclair's approach to language, the data that he brought along, just, um, you know, wowed me. Uh, I'm sure that at age, I don't know, 19 and a half or something, I did not grasp the full implications of what this meant for theory and, and, and teaching and research. But the substance, the sheer fascination of looking at real language rather than going by introspection and drawing syntactic trees endlessly. <laughs> My apologies to committed um, <laughs> out there who still use this method, oh, this, this theory. Um, you know, it was such a refreshing and totally overwhelming contrast. And that's what made me, you know, choose the linguistics track rather than the literary track and that all took off. So, so you studied English linguistics then as an undergraduate. Was that was well, that the the thing is English? I mean, in the in um, you know in continental Europe, you can't read at least at the time you couldn't do English linguistics. You did English, English language, and that had almost an equal component of lit, lang and lit. Ah, uh, okay. The um, you know, the decision to do linguistics was a this, you know early fascination with, with uh, language and my, my English teacher who uh, imparted this this passion for language. Uh, but then at a sort of later stage, getting towards the master's thesis and so on, I suppose I was also uh, happier writing about language than about literature. Um, again, no offence to our literary colleagues, but it had a lot to do with... Um, I don't know, in, in literary studies, I felt I had to, my own analytical text kind of had to almost be literary as well. I'm sure it was a misunderstanding, but it's how it felt. I just, I like the kind of clean argumentative prose that you could use in linguistics. Not oh, no, not at all, not at all. It, it, it sounds like, in terms of what we'll be discussing uh, in, in a moment, the synergy or combination between this course analysis and corpus linguistics it sounds like you were very much introduced to the study of text and, and discourse first and then the corpus part came a little bit later is that is that fair to say uh yes and also and i think that um, might sort of um lead into into the next uh into the next big big theme um based at vienna as i was at the time uh, i also had first-hand experience of critical discourse analysis because, of course, Ruth Bodak was uh, here as a, as, as a prof and uh, and she was equally inspiring. So there I was, you know, being inspired in equal measure by John Sinclair and Ruth Bodak. Well, you know, if you can't choose, um, you know, if you can't choose between them, combine them uh, to, to, to paraphrase them, uh, to help them join them. Um, and I think that's what I did. Um, and at, at what at what point did the uh, did your sort of interest in in this combination happen? Was this during your your PhD? Was was this after that, or, or at what point did you sort of become uh, 
sort of more actively interested in in corpus linguistics and and combining it with with critical discourse analysis it was after that it was during my my postdoc work um and it was almost a, a you know kind of a, a classic scenario there i was with uh hundreds of um uh, thousands of words of text about you know the european um representation of the eu in the british press um uh, and I didn't have the foggiest how to, you know, get a handle on on that data. And I, I remember, I mean, this, and I apologize for that being so dreadfully anecdotal, but that's exactly how it's sort of uh, impressed uh, in, in my memory. I was um, at Lancaster at the time, sitting in my study overlooking the um, playing fields in Palatine Avenue. And I thought, what the hell am I going to do? I need to, you know, I need to deliver. You know, I've got this 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 grant from the Austrian Science Fund to do research to complete my postdoc qualification. I've got the data, and I don't know what to do. And that's when you know the the other part of my socialization kind of kicked in. And of course, I didn't do this on a blank slate. I mean, I'm I'm always uh, very very keen to point out that of course there were people at the same time and partly before me, who had had similar ideas. Uh, there's, um, you know, there's, there's the Leach and Fallon 91 paper, I think. There's, of course, Mike Stubbs' work and uh, many, many others. Yeah, so that's where it clicked, uh, overlooking a Lancaster playing field, um, most likely on a rainy day. Yes, uh, if it's <laughs> Lancaster, <laughs> probably, yes. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm trying to sort of it, it, this seems quite an interesting situation where the, you know maybe a, I don't want to say new because as you say there there were other people ex, you know, exploring these sorts of things we're, we're talking kind of roughly the early nineties I think at, at this stage um, but certainly a, a, a method that or a combination that was not very well uh, known or, or certainly not very popular at the time but it, it it's interesting because. It seems like you had the data and and kind of the, the 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 solution to a problem that was that you had too much data. But it that that that's interesting to me because presumably, you know, a lot of people who were doing discourse analysis or specifically critical discourse analysis at the time would would select texts or or, or you know data data sets that were manageable in size. So I'm I'm kind of curious as to what what situation led to you kind of being in this you know, perhaps rather unique situation of I've got two. Why did you end? Why did you have more data than you could manage? You know, with the methods you already had, what, what was it that led to you having so much data and kind of thing? I need to come up with a way of somehow quantifying uh, the, the 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 things I'm noticing to an extent. Okay. Um, I've got two two answers to this question. Uh, an art, a sort of a, a sanitized one and a uh -huh. an honest one. Okay. Okay. Uh, the 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 sanitized one is that of course I'd already uh, caught the um, corpus linguistics bug and it might have been you know during the incubation period but I already had this inkling that I was going to do this. Uh, uh -huh. the truthful answer is um, bad planning and if any um, if any PhD students are watching this then please do maybe I should be speaking to the camera now uh, <laughs> do what. I did not do, but what I recommend to people, but of course one never follows one's own advice, um, run a pilot study. And Brilliant. I did. And the, um, I suppose this early experience is one of the reasons why the term data guzzling appears in a number of my publications and talks. It's what you do. You get class, and you know, and, and I spent, I mean, and at the time, I can tell you, you know, data guzzling wasn't easy because there was no... Lexis, Nexus, and so on. So it meant an awful lot of trips to um, the Collingdale newspaper library. It's the British Library. Black and fingers and all that. You don't want to hear that. I mean, it really dates. You know, it's, 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 it's awful. But, um, yeah, mutatis mutandis, the same problem still exists, that just because you can get all the states together, you do corpus grows and grows and if you you know if you did a, a more confined pilot study to begin with you could prevent all sorts of 
blind alleys that you go into. So you had all this data. Um, I think you mentioned the, the representation of the EU in, in the British press. Um, what was it that, considering you didn't do a pilot and you sort of <laughs> kind of were working on the fly, really, and, and there aren't that many people who have already published on the subject at the, at the time, so I, I suppose there's quite a lot of just trial and error going on and, and experimenting with the tools that are available at the time. Um, what, 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 what were the moments of reassurance, you know, during that period that, yes, this is going to work, you know, this, this is, this actually will help me to do what I want to do at a larger scale with all of this data I have. Were, were there any particular, um, you know, sort of observations or, or kind of eureka moments, so to speak, where you realized ah, yes, this is going to be okay, and, and, and maybe actually something that other people, you know, will be interested in, in doing as well in terms of this this sort of methodological approach. Um, I think calling it a eureka moment in this particular instance is perhaps a little bit too grand, but... Oh, sorry. I think, <laughs> <laughs> you know, words are cheap. But the um, I think the moment at which I realized that it was going to be promising uh is a moment that actually reoccurs every time uh, one starts a new project. And it's quite simply seeing, seeing the first concordance. And not only that, but the concordance itself as it comes up is sort of by text, you know, the order in which the texts appear in a corpus. But then you do your left sort and your right sort. And, and if you are lucky, something literally, you know, pops out, you think, ah, Okay, <laughs> I'm on to something. Um, it could have been, well, I think it was the first concordance uh, and um, maybe the first frequency list as well. You know, I've got this this feeling that um, this amorphous mass that is the corpus suddenly has pegs on which you can hang your investigation. It's not it's not more than that, I think, but it's that and also that. The realization that you can now do what corpus linguistics is so good at, namely um, allow you to play with your data, but at no added cost. In other words, without spending hours um, classifying, categorizing things, but simply you know, take the corpus as is, trust the text, as John Sinclair said in a publication, and play with it. So the ludic element is so important and it's often literally the first you know entry point to the data so i i think that yeah that 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 makes sense and certainly resonates with me in in that you know we we sort of as we're writing about our research we we have to present a kind of systematic uh a, approach and and increasingly you know the the, the way that the field in social science more broadly is is moving there's a focus on uh, replication and, and you know, having a, a kind of objectively verifiable and, and repeatable approach. But I think probably most of us are the same in that that's all fine and well. But when you first get your data ready, certainly my, my, my approach to just diving in is not systematic. I'm just sort of searching for things and go, oh, look at that. Oh, that's interesting. And kind of just, as you say, playing. And I think that's a really... That's a really nice way of putting it because I think that for me, when I was first learning about this stuff, also at Lancaster, um, uh, w that that was the thing that that drew me in was that you have an interface through which you can search for stuff that you're curious about and see what's there, if anything, um, and then develop a sort of more principled kind of approach at, as as you go. But I, I I think that 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 element is certainly still you know all, always there i think in, in in everything i do as well i wanted to ask as well I, I, I obviously in you know we we can't possibly talk in in so much detail about every every study you, you've done throughout throughout your your career um but sort of between then and now we're, we're capturing uh quite quite a, a period here there are certain themes in terms of the 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 topics that you that you address in your research um, earlier on, as, as you mentioned, sort of European politics and, and sort of the EU, and, and that's come back a bit later on, obviously more recently with Brexit. Um, 
And there have been, you know, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, business discourse, corporate communication. Uh, there have been some some studies you published on news discourse more broadly, and of course, news discourse is often a way through which to access these these discourses about political topics. Um, I suppose I'm asking, what what is it about the the context that you have studied that that have drawn you in? It, is it the on the CDA side of things? You know, you're drawn to places where powerful voices uh, potentially, you know, spread their, their you know, attempt to influence the the public. And, and is that sort of what draws you in or are there other kind of reasons for uh, the focusing on, on, on the context that you have in, in your research? Um, interesting question. Um, I feel at the end of the day, I'll probably benefit more from this, this interview than, than, than the listeners were making me reflect on my own practice. Um, I think it's mostly the um, institutional environment uh, in which I work, which is a um, university of economics and business, and um, the. I mean, we, we have lots of colleagues in management sociology departments here who, uh, you know, do take a very critical. Um, you know, you have adopted a very critical perspective. So it's it's not all about you know. Oh, market capitalism is wonderful. Uh, so there's, there is actually in, within management studies a, a subfield that's called critical management studies, and it's like a sister discipline of CDA, if you will. You know, very much the same terms. And I guess what what interests me particularly about business discourse um, are cases where um, what tends to be called the the, the neoliberal agenda um, comes through, and uh, where I mean, j- just to take. One kind of the most recent example. I'm currently working on um, various aspects of leadership discourse. Um, we're all leaders now, you know. Uh, in fact, the word leader appears in every other ad for um, for university, you know, for faculty appointments. Yeah, no. And um, people, or roles rather, who um, would have been referred to as management or manager, managerial, whatever, uh, now have to be leader. You know, leaders and leadership, um, and that's interesting because it's um, it, it's worth deconstructing that, and it's worth saying, actually, you know, using that old um, that old um, saying, actually, the I'm not sure the emperor has any clothes on. I think you know, so the to take the uh, the, the CDA m- mindset, um, you know. Debunking, taking for granting, granted assumptions, and so on, and do that on the basis of, of, of corporate. That's really, that's really fascinating, and I think it's worth doing. It's, it is worth. Doing. Let, let's go. With, let's go with that example. Actually, that that is really interesting, um, and I appreciate it might be quite a, a, a big sort of topic to dive into. But if you can briefly kind of give your thoughts on why. Uh, or what the, the the causes may be for such a change uh, with that example of, of, of focus on leadership um, uh, as opposed to management. What, what what do you think is the broader trends that that represents? Um, that is a very very difficult question because it is it is indeed a mega trend, and incidentally, as a as a, as a social mega trend that appears in so many walks of life. Um, whenever you investigate something like this, um, corpus linguistics is perhaps not the best candidate because where would you start? You know, what what could your corpus possibly be? Which is why, for example, in my Language of the Market Society book, I hardly used corpus um, methods at all. Um, you know, the, one, one's got to have the... Uh, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, but the um, I suppose the, the the insight or the courage not to constantly go for one method and then try desperately to fit the data to uh, that doesn't that doesn't work. It's not very sensible. Um, so it is it is a a, a trend which um, has you know it's sort of it's the broad heading usually is neoliberalism. Um, you know the market rules. Um, we, I mean, as as university uh, and as academics, we we um, we're at the receiving end of this. You know, uh, cue the target and target and audit culture. Cue focus on output on deliverables. 
So the discourse of the market really has infiltrated so many social domains. Uh, you know, patients have become clients, etc. Uh, that kind of thing. And uh, leadership, both the concept and the terms like um, you know, lead done as a as a, a social act term. Uh, these uh, ter- in these terms, uh, a lot of those things kind of crystallised, right? And um, um, the uh, only recently, you know, I've started collaborating with colleagues from uh, Reading and Newcastle, respectively, and Nottingham, and and you know, we're looking at various aspects of this discourse. And corpus linguistics doesn't have the answers, but as we know, it helps you uh, get. Uh, handling on the data. You said something interesting there about, um, you know, being brave in, in not necessarily just sticking with one particular method in this case, of course, corpus linguistics and, you know, being brave enough to, to just use the approach that helps you to address the question with the data that you have, even if that isn't what you might uh, fashion yourself as being do you think that there are i'm just going to ask you directly do, do you think that there are perhaps um too many or maybe one is too many i don't know but do you think there are a number of of, of researchers who maybe are slightly um have slightly maybe tunnel vision might be a term to use in terms of i'm a corpus linguist and that's what i do and and do you think that you know there should be a little bit more. Uh, I'm putting words in your mouth. I'm just giving you, I suppose, options. Uh, do, you, do you think that, that that you know? Do you think that 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 should be the case? Do you think that should? Do you think it should be the case that there are people who are? I'm a corporate linguist, and that that is how I identify myself as my discipline. It's my method, but it's also my field. Um, or do you think? Do you think that that should exist? Should we all be linguists who use whatever method we? we need in the particular context we're working in, which may include, but certainly be not limited to corpus linguistics. Definitely the, the, the latter. I mean, um, the there's a very um, um, potentially um, negative sort of unholy alliance between uh, academic identity and um, preference for certain methods and um in sort of finding yourself in a in an academic silo is very often the unintended consequence uh and uh the that's unfortunate because it's dysfunctional right if you uh if you're totally um in love with a particular method you just fail to see what else there might be uh, for a particular project, it may not be suitable. Uh, and, um, you know, if you've, uh, um, got, I mean, this is a very old metaphor, which I think I used in the 1994, uh, 1995 paper. Um, I mean, if you, um, go to the hardware store, you know, B and Q, whatever they are now called in the UK, um, you come up with a screwdriver. Well, don't be surprised if it's no good for hammering in, in a nail, you know, but when you get a hammer, don't be surprised that it won't actually help you uh, uh, screw in a screw. So uh, the there is this unfortunate tendency, uh, I suppose on the part of you know, people generally, but certainly academics, weirdly enough, there shouldn't be, but I think academics, and that certainly includes myself, it, 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 it's, a, it's a general problem. Um, by the way, we're not supposed to talk about problems anymore, it's a challenge. Ah, that's, challenge. That's something that corporate can tell you actually that um, the <laughs> problem and difficulty and conflict, etc., are on the way out. Challenge and opportunity. Uh, so the challenge is to uh, not allow your, you know, identity become so strong that you are no longer open-minded. And I think uh, the that the silos wouldn't matter quite so much if they didn't have the added negative consequence of often being quite exclusionary. Um, I remember at a, um, some small corpus um, research meeting a, f- a few years ago, there was a rather crestfallen um, PhD student. Uh, he gave a brilliant talk, uh, but he was still kind of shaken because at our previous 
small conference, somebody in the audience had said, this isn't a corpus linguistic. No. And, you know, and we all felt it was. But, you know, he was really something about that. And this is this, um, we and everybody else, us and them, unfortunately, that can develop. And it's, as I said, it's dysfunctional. It doesn't help. And language is so infuriatingly complex. We need everything we can throw at it, everything, and uh, not sort of be precious about what it's called or whether we're in this school of thought or that school of thought. So do you think, that, uh, God, we we could talk for hours about just this question, so I think it's fascinating. Um, I'll try and succinctly ask what I, at least one of the many things that I could ask at this point. Um, so do you, do, you, do you think that, what, I mean, what one solution, I suppose, is that you, if you have people who are, you know, quite exclusively, you know, methodological specialists and kind of wed themselves to corpus linguistics, um, one thing that I could ask about, which I probably can't, can't for reasons of time, is there's a risk potentially, uh, or do you think there's a risk potentially associated with that in, in you know, maybe corpus linguistics won't uh, exist in the way it does uh, forever and maybe wedding yourself to a particular method that might put your risk of becoming redundant, particularly with, you know, uh, generative AI, for example, there's a lot of papers that come out in, in recent months about what potentially generative AI could do for data analysis. And will there be a, a will there be a need for somebody who's a skilled manual concordance analyst in the next within the next ten years, for instance, if eventually uh, such tools could just do that bit for you? That's one thing. And I, I mean, if you, if you do want to talk about that, well, then then we can as well. But but I suppose my my question is. Um, does it matter if, if people are, are wedded methodologically if their research is is often collaborative and interdisciplinary in that you could have one person in, in a team uh, of a pair of co-authors or a group of co-authors, one person who is the corpus person and that's all they know and all they do, and then you have other people who do other things and then you come together. I'm thinking, for example, about some of the um, relatively early, if not influential papers in Corpus assisted discourse studies, for example, the the work by uh, Paul Baker and Costas Gabrielatos on on uh, immigration and um, uh, asylum seekers, where you you had a, a, a team of of uh, I believe Ruth uh, Wodek was involved in that work as well. You know, a team of, of people who maybe some of them did both, but some certainly did one or the other, and they came together, and that seemed to work. So, does does that kind of siloing matter if you are working in these kind of collaborative ways with people who have the specialisms of course it, it then no longer does i mean you um you know i didn't mean to suggest what has to happen that one person has to do has to do everything what that what that one person from either camp uh it needs to have at the very least is that awareness uh that that it would be good if they collaborated absolutely and um Actually, on that note, if I could, you know, add a sort of something with a bit of missionary zeal here, um, if uh, if you, you know, if the audience out there uh, ever gets a chance to collaborate with uh, people from uh, social sciences generally, um, sociology, business management studies, do you know take the opportunity? Uh, of course, there are lots of wonderful examples already, but by and large, uh, my colleagues from management studies tend to be more familiar with either the qualitative um, types of software like N NVivo, Atlas TI, Max QDA, et cetera, or um, the um, sort of topic modeling end. And, uh, you know, and they um, could could do with a bit of input, many of them could do with a bit of input from uh, from corpus linguistics, and uh, this is all sort of a, a line that I'm pursuing together with colleagues to try and popularise the approach uh, beyond the confines of, of, of linguistics. And also, I mean, I should one other thing I wanted to to add is that um, of course, CADS researchers rely on and depend heavily on uh, sort of the more technically minded. Uh, colleagues from uh, corpus sort of corpus linguistics people writing code and 
um, you know, we, we we need them desperately to to help you know to pr provide the tools. So by all means, it's just that when you do CADs, don't forget that it's a, you know it consists of two parts: there's a computer assisted part and there's the Discord part. And in a specific project, it's very easy to become so engrossed with the corpus part and the computer based part that you kind of forget about the discourse part. Well, that's a shame. I. I agree. Sp speaking of tools, you, you mentioned something that I, I wanted to ask you about um, in in that probably, oh, I say probably as if I'm not, I'm, I'm pretty certain actually it's a comfortable majority of, of researchers in uh, corpus linguistics broadly, but certainly in, in you know, the subfield, if you will, of corpus assisted discourse studies, corpus based CDA, whichever labels you, you want to use for it, those who use corpus linguistics in some way to assist with discourse studies, uh, however defined, um, rely on the use of tools that uh, a fairly small number of uh, researchers have developed and made available. And I've interviewed uh, you know, a few of these on previous episodes, uh, just recently had Lawrence Anthony, for example, who uh, of course develops uh, AntConc, uh, among many others. Uh, last year, uh, we had the uh, Sketch Engine, uh, for instance, uh, discussing uh, that tool as well, uh, uh, Milos uh, um It's a fairly small number of people who, uh, you know, develop these tools that are used by a large number of, of researchers. Um, therefore, and this is not a this is not a profound or, or you know new topic for discussion. This has come up a lot at conferences and things uh, over the years, but they have a certain power, if you will, uh, they may not frame it in that way, but they have a certain power in terms of facilitating and, and delimiting um, indirectly uh, what what many researchers can or can't do uh, by virtue of their reliance on these tools. So, um, you know, but I, I, I'm, I'm asking you because I know that you have opinions about this sort of thing, and I can be first hand that you have opinions about this, if I may sort of uh, tell a, a, a brief anecdote a few years ago at a, a conference um, in Cardiff, uh, the Corpus Linguistics Conference, in a very, very hot week in, in Cardiff, um, I, I gave a talk with Lawrence Anthony uh, talking about some some uh, ideas we had, I suppose, for how to better uh, work with spoken corpus data in, in concordances, looking at ANCOM specifically. And um, we were proposing a kind of yet another new way of, of querying uh, corpus data with yet another new query syntax. Uh, and you were there watching the talk and, and at the end of the Q&A, you put your hand up and I can't quote uh, directly. I don't remember exactly the words you used, but I remember there was probably a bit of sighing um, and, <laughs> and, a, and a little bit of, uh, maybe a little bit of frustration. And, and the gist of what you were saying was, why do we need yet another new way of, of you know, don't we already have enough sort of new uh, sort of methods to query uh corporate you know and and the gist was essentially why can't why can't these different tools kind of come together in some way and 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 not be constantly trying to go and show that you know do something differently and, and potentially sort of confusing people with yet another new way of doing something rather than you know making what we already do better and kind of more comprehensive i i, I mean correct me if i'm wrong but I, that was gen sort of the gist of what you were what you were saying there was a frustration of yet another new completely new feature which doesn't which allows you to do something we already do but just in a different way unnecessarily i suppose my, my question is you know that was only a few years ago how are you feeling about this at the moment and 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 what what's your what's your wish list so to speak you know how, how do you think this kind of situation could be improved um i'm afraid i have no um no ideas really on how to improve the situation uh how to get there but um as far as the end point you know the the um uh, the goal that it would be ideal for for users is uh you know user friendliness user friendliness and user friendliness uh people who are not keen on and in fact don't know how to you know allow myself somebody who doesn't know how to write code uh we want to click on things and uh, you know, I mean, the, the corpus query language in Sketch Engine—that's about the limit that I can, you know, master. Um, 
And but even there, I mean, it's, it's just helpful to have a reminder of what the tags are, etc. Um, the um, and I think the, the the more the pressure grows on people to publish, to, to do lots of research, to publish a lot, etc. It is simply unrealistic to assume that everybody can have full command of various tools, then select the one that's best suited to a particular project. It's not going to happen. I mean, it, you know, some people may respond to this, but I've done this. Well, you know, congratulations, I stand in awe. But most people just don't have the time, the resources, in my case, don't have the brains to write code and and really sort of get get into it uh, on that level. So we rely on the developers to do that for us. And, um, you know, we, we also have to rely on them to uh, help us use corpus tools to kind of feed our passion for language rather than computer code. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, uh, so that would be on my, on, on my wish list, you know, keep developing uh, the usability. Um, and also, um, I mean, simple things like um, um, producing concordances that can be printed out neatly. Um, I remember I, I, I put this question to a developer and I said, I'm really struggling to, you know, download concordances, format them so that I can, you know, neatly print them out. And his first, his first and actually only response was, why do you want to print them out in the first place? And of course, it made me feel like a you know like a dinosaur straight away because the the answer I'm not, I, I don't think I actually owned up at that moment, but the answer is because I wanted to take a highlighter pen, sit in one of uh, Vienna's wonderful coffee houses, and go through a concordance and make no you know on a piece of paper. Um, as I said, I probably get a lot of um, flack for, for saying this, except for being honest that was, about it. That was quite nice, really. It's... And uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, copy out anyway. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, that's that's that, that's great. As we start to 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 wrap up here, and and I have to say, this has been a really interesting uh, conversation. We've we've sort of talked about all sorts of various things. I'll, I'll try and kind of tie it together here and and bring it back to to had and sort of if you think back to when you're sitting there i think you said the palatine avenue in, in lancaster in uh in the uh nine, early 90s and you're um working out how to deal with all of this data that you have and and you fast forward um essentially about 30 years um to the the, the field now and you know as as i mentioned at the beginning you've, you've recently published a a new book on corpus assisted discourse studies and it's very much established as, you know, something that has taken off over the last three decades. And, and now there are conference series and journals and, and book series dedicated specifically to this sub variety of corpus linguistics. And it has boomed and, and people doing PhDs and, and, you know, people have made entire careers on, on, on exactly this, this approach, this combination of corpus linguistics and, and discourse analysis, I suppose. And, and again, I know you you resist uh, the you know the, the the sort of discourse around being a a, a pioneer or, or or whatever. But you you know it, let let me at least say you were certainly an early adopter, uh, if, if, if you know if, if not the first, very very much in in among the the first uh, few, right? Um, how how do you sort of feel, kind of looking at how how things have taken off with these approaches in in Thirty years since, is there a? Did you see it coming? You know, did you did you think at the time as as you were working on your your EU uh, discourses in, in the British press data that oh I think lots of, I think there'll be lots of things that people can do with this, or, or did it surprise you? You know, how how do you feel sort of reflecting on on what's happened? I suppose well, uh, in three decades since. Um. I suppose I am pleasantly surprised. Um, one thing that was has always been good about the, you know, the rise of of, of CADs was that I was never aware of any any real hostility toward it. That's which is good. You know, it's the, there are you know schools that have emerged and that have immediately sort of attracted quite a lot of flack from from other researchers. So I don't think that's ever happened. What did 
um, you know, what made me wonder at the time and sort of while I was still at Lancaster and a bit afterwards was that um, the uh, it did take a while to be accepted as a, as an approach by um, the the core CDA community, for want of a better word. Um, and uh, again, there was no no hostility, but the uh, there was occasionally a lack of a lack of enthusiasm. And um, you know, there were still people who were not enthusiastic about it, which is fine because, as I said, perhaps we need people who sort of um, you, you know temper that enthusiasm a little and remind us that the complexity of discourse and the depth and riches of qualitative analysis should not be uh, ignored, should not be forgotten. And of course, we should also not forget that large parts of, of CADs, large part of the computer system part, are actually a qualitative form of inquiry. Uh, that would be another um, you know, sort of, uh, signpost that I think is worth erecting, is that it is, uh, you know, when you do concordance analysis specifically, that is a qualitative endeavor. And um, yeah, but I think sorry, I, I veered off your question. It was also about the, you know the, the the future. You briefly mentioned AI. Uh, that is going to be a big big issue, and uh, I have been looking at some of these papers that have come out recently. Very interesting papers about uh, how um, you know how AI will or will not impact on on the uh, study. If anything, it, it, I think it'll mean, and this is crystal ball gazing now, obviously, but I think it'll mean that the discourse part, the qualitative interpretive part, is going to become ever more important. Uh, at the minute, computers are not very good at this, and uh, that's where our strengths as human beings still lie. So we've still got plenty of work to do, and we're not going to be replaced by the machines just yet. Uh. <laughs> not, not just yet, no. <laughs> but in thirty years' time, you could do the blog post with a computer, you know, computer-generated image of a yes. researcher. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, Galinda, thank you so much. I, I, I'm actually, uh, I think, for the first time, um, I'm not going to ask any. Uh, quick questions. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, you've already answered the ones that I was going to ask, uh, more or less. Uh, I was going to ask you about the future. Actually, okay, I lie. I'm, I will ask you one, um, because uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, if there are any uh, postgraduate researchers, PhD students watching, and, and indeed there are, we, we, you know, we do have um, PhD students who, who are very much interested in, in, in hearing from the guests and corpus cast. So I, I will finish now with, with just one quick question. Um, which is, uh, what is your number one piece of advice for students who are embarking uh, on corpus linguistics, corpus research? Be passionate, but keep an open mind. It might not be the right method, but if it is, uh, your project will blossom fly whatever grand metaphor you want to use and it's it's going to be fun as well so enjoy the fun uh while also remaining self-reflective and um and critical uh, you know reflecting on your work and um and don't i know this is, can be so so hard and it just never stops but if for some reason the corpus won't yield up its secrets. Maybe it's because the method doesn't fit. And then go for a different one. This is a very downbeat conclusion. We shouldn't end on this note, should we? <laughs> There's something wrong with Robbie. I think it's great. I, I, I think because, you know, certainly, I, I mean, I'm definitely guilty of this, of, of sort of identifying myself as, oh, I'm, I'm a corpus linguist, but but why? I mean, we're really getting existential here, but why do you have to be that type, you know, if, if that's just, well, I, I only do stuff with large data sets or I only use these methods, you know, why, why does it have to be that way? And, and certainly you 
I'm reflecting a lot on what what you said because I think you're right that 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 is a um, a, a sort of self imposed box that we put ourselves in completely un, unnecessarily uh, in a way. Can I have a second stab at answering this question? You don't have I don't think it out the first one, but it's um, somehow for me a key word in the qualitative part of corpus linguistics has always been mess and messy data. And my advice would be don't be scared by the messiness and don't try to argue it away. Don't try to sort of clean it up somehow. But when the corpus turns out to yield those messy results is because that's what language and social life is like. So mess is to be uh, confronted is even the wrong word. It's it's um, supposed to be embraced, I think. At the same time, of course, if there is an opportunity to um, impose a bit of order, do, but not uh, not too much. So otherwise that might actually misrepresent the data. I should. <laughs> <laughs> Two for one. Um, Galinda Mountner, thank you so much uh, for, for coming on Corpus Cast. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you and I really appreciate your time. Um, that is it. I'm pivoting now to looking back into the camera um, to say that this is all for this episode of Corpus Cast, episode 27. Uh, we are really flying through uh, season three, 2024, of course. We're, we're, we are uh, rolling away through the year. So thank you for joining us uh, on your platform of choice, um, be that YouTube or wherever it is that you get your uh, podcasts. Um, in the meantime, do let us know your thoughts using the hashtag Corpus Casts and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics uh, research group on X at Aston Corpus and you can follow me at Love and Mob. Corpus Cast is an Aston Originals podcast uh, written and hosted by me, Robbie Love and produced by uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Sam Cook. Um, so thanks again and we'll see you soon on the next episode of Corpus Cast. Galinda Mountner, thank you once again. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today. Not at all. My pleasure entirely. Thanks, Robbie and thanks, Sam.